Today we're going to be investigating one of the prophecies that Isaiah prophesied, and he was around about 700 BC, and he spoke these words. He said, unto us, meaning Israel, unto us, a child will be born, and a son will be given, and the government will be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called the following titles, Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. They're the titles that he's given, according to the prophet Isaiah. And then he goes on to say, Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. And upon the throne of David and over his kingdom, to order it and establish it with judgment and justice. From that time forward, even forever, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. So Isaiah, 700 years before Jesus, comes and he prophesies to the nation of Israel and, I guess, to the world. But he's speaking unto us, the Israelites, the Jewish people. A child will be born, but not just born, a son will be given to events. A child is born, it means a child is born from a mother, but also a son is given. Now, this same son is given the title Everlasting Father, Mighty God. And so he's born, but he's also given. And the Father God gives this son who inhabits eternity with him. One of the titles of God is also, we know, the one whom sits in, who sits enthroned in eternity. So God, who sits enthroned in eternity, gives a son. A son is given, but also a child is born. And then it goes on to talk about how the government will be on his shoulder. The government will be on his shoulder. And his name will be called Wonderful People will call the name of this child who is going to be called, who's going to be born, they're going to call it Wonderful. 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 Full of wonder. This child is going to be full of wonder. And you look at the life of Jesus and you say, how can you not wonder? You know, that that life was full of wonder. Jesus did so many amazing, miraculous signs and things that make us wonder. Like, wow, amazing, powerful, supernatural things. He was called wonderful, full of wonder. And he was also called counselor. People flocked to him to get his counsel. He had some of the most incredible teachings the world has ever known. And what Why would we expect anything less from the one to whom the title is given, Mighty God? So so Isaiah, Isaiah, this is the the context, 700 years before Jesus prophesies one of the um, defining characteristics of the coming Messiah, and that would be that he would be God himself in the flesh. The Messiah wasn't just someone who would come to save humanity from their sins, but it would be, in fact, God who became man, giving himself up for humanity. And so the title of Jesus is Mighty God. That's who he is. He is this child who is born of a human being, a son that is given by God the Father. He is wonderful, full of wonder. He is a counselor, incredibly intelligent, transcendently wise, limitlessly understanding, far beyond anything we can possibly think or imagine. And he's also given the title Mighty God and Everlasting Father. Now, this is one of the big um, struggles that people have, and they try and understand God in His entirety, being limited by a human mind, a created mind, a, a mind bound to the dimensions in which we live. And, but God, being the Creator, being the eternal Creator, transcends all dimensions. He's beyond them all, and we have no idea how many there are. But He's far bigger and greater than all of those dimensions, which means to understand Him, we would have to understand the way that those dimensions interact and the way that, you know, the environments, and, and we just can't. So to understand that is, is beyond our ability, but what we can understand is what God has revealed to us about Him. And, um, and so, so Jesus is, God is also given the title Everlasting Father, and Jesus often said, 
when you've, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And that's one of the attributes of Jesus. He is one with the everlasting Father, but he is also God. Jesus is God. He's God in the flesh. And it's also true that Jesus prayed to the Father as a separate person who was in the heavens. He said, Father in heaven, hallowed, holy, righteous, set apart is your name. And he submitted himself to the will of the Father and never did anything except that which he saw the Father do spiritually or heard the Father say spiritually. He was connected to the Father. And so he's one with the Father. His title is Everlasting Father, Mighty God, but he's also prayerfully communicating with this Father as well. And so although we can't completely understand how that works, we should expect that we can't understand how that works. Why? Because God is transcendently... uh, In his nature, he is transcendent in his nature. He is limitlessly greater. His attributes are un... un, un, We just don't have the ability to interpret who he is in his entirety except to to believe the attributes that he's expressed to us through his word. And so that's what he's done. And So he's called the Everlasting Father, but he's also called the Prince of Peace. He is the one who brings peace. And there are people... You know, the world looks to leaders, to governments, to societies to bring about peace. And some do better jobs than others, but ultimately no one is going to bring peace except Jesus. There's going to be war, there's going to be sin, there's going to be devastating events that happen in the world until the root cause for all of these horrible things is dealt with and the root is sin. And the only person who can deal with sin is Jesus. So he came in his first coming, he came spirit to, well, he came physically, but he came to deal with the kingdom of God's establishment spiritually, because it comes in two parts, spiritual and physical. So Jesus' first coming obviously was physical. He physically was born of a virgin Mary, conceived by the Holy Spirit, and God became a man. He was born, and God, God the Father gave his eternal son into the world as a human being, And then he lived a life. And the purpose of Jesus' coming was to live physically, as a man, a life that was perfect and righteous and fulfilled fulfilled every part of the Tanakh, every detail of the Torah. And Jesus did it all. He fulfilled it all. And he was perfect. And he never sinned. And he did a great job. um, But then he was put to death. But because he never sinned, he never should have died, so the grave couldn't hold him because the grave can only hold those who have sinned because the penalty for sin is death. And Jesus never sinned, so the grave couldn't hold him, so he was raised from the dead, this same Son of God who bled on the cross. And so he, the grave couldn't hold him. He defeated death. And, uh, and we know the story. He ascended into heaven, and that's where he is now. But he made atonement for the world, for the sins of the world. And he made this declaration that only those who would repent and say, God, God, I'm sorry for all the bad stuff. I need your um, Holy Spirit to come and fill me and lead me in a life that would please you, that would bless and love other people. He said, for those that are willing to do that, they are going to be forgiven. Their sins are going to be washed away, removed as far as the east is from the west. There will be, therefore, now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And that's what he has made available to those willing to lay down their pride and give their lives to him. And so that's the plan, that's the gospel. And so so what about this peace? Well, why isn't there peace in the world now? Well, Jesus came and he demonstrated his love. And what he, you probably heard the story as he hung on the cross, he looked at his enemies and rather than cursing them as most of us would do, he said, Father, forgive them, they don't know what they're doing. And he forgave even his enemies. He taught, bless those who persecute you. Pray for those who abuse you and use you and are horrible to you. He's a, you know, he reversed the mindset of the world. And, um, but he's, he's a God of love and he demonstrated that with every breath of his life. But as we've just read through the prophet Isaiah, he is also a God of justice and judgment. And Jesus explained that God the Father has appointed all judgment to the Son. And so Jesus will be the judge on judgment day. He will be the one to whom we give an account for the things that we've done in our bodies, both good and bad. We're going to stand before that throne room of God, and He is going to be the one who judges us. And uh, He's a God both of love, but also judgment and justice, and He doesn't turn a blind eye to sin. 
I'm afraid. And that's a good attribute, although for those of us who are criminals, we don't like to enjoy that. Uh, that's something that <clears throat> we don't like to think about, but it is true. And so the goodness of God is that he's made provision for our sins to be atoned for. So here we have the Prince of Peace, and peace hasn't yet been completely established in the world, but spiritually the first element of it has. God has sent his Holy Spirit into the world to convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment and to transform people into the image of God. And so he has made a way for us to be at peace spiritually with God. So we're not yet completely at peace with fellow man because the the existence of sin is still here. But we can be spiritually at peace with God, to whom, without Jesus, without the blood of Jesus, the wrath of of God abides on us. And that's what uh, John the Baptizer, or John the Dunker, said. He preached that anyone who has not yet accepted the Son remains, the wrath of God abides on them because of their sins. And so Jesus came to get rid of that, but he has to cooperate with our will, because he respects that incredibly. He, He really values our will. And so God has made a way for our sins to be forgiven um, through Jesus. And, um, and so Jesus is the Prince of Peace. So peace has come initially, spiritually, but it's also going to come physically. And the way that's going to happen is when he returns. When Jesus returns, he's going to establish his kingdom physically on the earth, not just spiritually. And he's going to return to a place in Jerusalem, in Israel, to a mountain called the Mount of Olives. And um, he's going to return there. His feet are going to touch down there. And angels, when he ascended, said, just the same way that you see the Son of Man leaving, you're going to see him returning. And so that's what Jesus is going to do. Jesus is going to come back to the Mount of Olives and is going to return there and establish his throne, his kingdom there for eternity. Um, and, And as it says here, upon the throne of David and over his kingdom throne of David and over David's kingdom, Israel. That's the place from which Jesus will rule and reign. From that location and from that time forward, even forever, God is going to order it. And he's going to establish it with judgment and justice. And there are many verses in the Bible that talk about his second coming and the way he's going to do it. And he's going to, he's going to be coming back in a warlike manner. And he's going to destroy many ungodly nations and people and people who are evil God, Jesus is going to come back as a warrior and he's going to defeat them. And he isn't, he isn't evil. He's the God of justice. He executes perfect justice. He's like the judge of, of the universe and beyond the universe. He is the eternal creator and he is also the, the judge. And he's going to come back to make war on the enemies of God. And so that's, that's the way that it's going to happen. And so when you look into the world and see, you see all the bad stuff, remember... It's not finished yet, but you can look to Jesus to be uh, reconciled to God. And the sin problem will be dealt with, but it will take time. And the reason sin exists is because God is long-suffering, not wanting any to perish, but for all people to repent and turn to Him. So that's the, the main message today. Be blessed in Jesus' name.